If we were to take Hinduism as a whole, its vast literature, its complicated rituals, its sprawling folkways, its opulent art, and compress it into a single affirmation, we would find it saying, you can have what you want. This throws the question back into our laps, for what do we want? India has lived with this question for ages and has her answer waiting. People, she says, want four things. They begin by wanting pleasure. This is natural. To the person who wants pleasure, India says in effect, go after it, there is nothing wrong with it. This India says and waits. It waits for the time it will come to everyone, though not to everyone in one's present life, when one realizes that pleasure is not all that one wants. When this time comes, the individual's interests usually shift to the second major goal of life, which is worldly success, with its three prongs of wealth, fame, and power. However, wealth, fame, and power are exclusive, hence competitive, hence precarious. Unlike mental and spiritual values, they do not multiply when shared. They cannot be distributed without diminishing one's own portion. Furthermore, the drive for success is insatiable. In Hindu idiom, to try to extinguish the drive for riches with money is like trying to quench a fire by pouring butter over it. Worldly success is also identical with that of hedonism. It too centers meaning in the self, which proves to be too small for perpetual enthusiasm. Neither fortune nor station can obscure the realization that one lacks so much else. And the final reason why worldly success cannot satisfy us completely is that its achievements are ephemeral. Wealth, fame, and power do not survive bodily death. You can't take it with you, as we routinely say. All in all, Hinduism regards objects of the path of desire as if they were toys. The father of children without them is sad. Even sadder, however, is the prospect of adults who fail to develop interests more significant than dolls and dreams. The world's offerings are not bad. By and large, they are good. Some are good enough to command our enthusiasm for many lifetimes. Eventually, however, every human being comes to realize with Simone Weil that there is no true good here below, that everything that appears to be good in this world is finite, limited, wears out, and once worn out, leaves necessity exposed in all its nakedness. When this point is reached, one finds oneself asking, even of the best this world can offer, is this all? Life holds other possibilities. To see what these are, we must return to the question of what people want. To gather the wants into a single word, what people really want is liberation, moksha, release from the finitude that restricts us from the limitless being, consciousness, and bliss our hearts desire. Infinite being, infinite awareness, and infinite bliss are within our reach. Not only are these goods within people's reach, says Hinduism, people already possess them. Underlying the human self and animating it is a reservoir of being that never dies, is never exhausted, and is unrestricted in consciousness and bliss. This infinite center of every life, this hidden self or Atman, is no less than Brahman, the Godhead. Body, personality, and Atman Brahman, a human self is not completely accounted for until all three of these are noted. But if this is true, and we really are infinite in our being, why is this not apparent? Why do we not act accordingly? The answer, says the Hindus, lies in the death at which the eternal is buried under the almost impenetrable mass of distractions, false assumptions, and self-regarding instincts that comprise our surface selves. The problem life poses for the human self is to cleanse the dross of its being to the point where its infinite center can shine forth in full display.